morning, Sam. Hello. That's better, Alec, isn't it? Is that better? Yeah, cool. Okay, that brilliant. That worked, anyway. <laughs> um, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it feels early. <laughs> it was early enough, but I've got, I've got a black coffee here, so... But um, that's better than I'm, me. I'm doing all right. Yeah, <laughs> that's better than me. I, I haven't managed to get one yet. Um, I'm still recovering. Okay. The, you can't get the security guard to bring one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still kind of... Um, yeah, recovering from um, the event that we had the other day, which we, we probably don't need to go too much into, but, yeah. Um, OK, so... I fear that if we did, we'd talk about nothing else. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's really lovely to speak with you, Mr Alec Bowman, and thank you for joining me for Sam Liu Uncased, episode four, um, which should be a Christmas special, actually, I thought... <laughs> You might be Super. really pleased well, to know uh, that. Yeah, I mean, jingle up, yeah. <laughs> OK, um, so, um, Alec, you've been having a bit of a busy time lately and um, you've just finished working on your album. Do you want to tell us about your new LP? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to. That'd be great. And uh, so, yeah, I finished it two weeks ago and it's called I Used To Be Sad and Then I Forgot. And it's ten tracks of pretty much... Uh, me and an acoustic guitar with uh, Josie and Clark producing and adding some uh, some kind of cheery flavor. Some happy magic dust is sprinkled over it by her. And yeah, it's that's it's really being beautiful. Mixed at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, really it's, beautiful. It's a simple record. There's there's mm. no percussion, um, and uh, it's it's in the process of being mixed. I've heard the first two, and that's coming together beautifully. So I'm hoping to get that out in March onto Bandcamp. So yeah. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, so you can give us the details at the end of the um, chat there. That would be great. Um, so I just wanted to kind of ask you about sort of how you would define your, define yourself. Um, your Twitter bio. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Ah, uh, you mean uh, you mean master of nothing? I'm going to get you to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, that's um. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad you asked me that. Lots of people talk about it. It seems like a kind of knowable thing. It, it's kind of a riff on um, the jack of all trades, master of none saying that people use. And I, I, I just really kind of, it came, it came about when I wrote, I'm a musician, songwriter, director and photographer. And that feels like a lot of things to be. And I think people struggle with the idea that you're not a specialist and I'm not claiming to be the best one of any of those things I, i'm not the greatest anything and i never will be i learn something new on every photo shoot you're not hiring me because i'm a famous photographer or director um so i don't know master nothing uh, it's kind of uh, it's meant to be gently self-deprecating um you know those are the things i do i've been doing them for a long time i think that i like to let my portfolio speak for itself if, if you like what i do and enjoy my aesthetic then uh, maybe i could do some things for you but mm. yeah you're touching you're on not, um... you're not hiring me I'm, I'm not steve gullick you know so, uh... <laughs> are you not oh we'll have to end the conversation <laughs> now then i think um uh, you're touching on lots of things there that I'm really interested in, in terms of how we define ourselves and how we, um, say if we take Twitter bios as a perfect example, really, you've got like, the, the, you know, a couple of lines to play with there. And um, yeah. we're all doing so many different things as well. A lot of us are. Um, so it, it then becomes which and what order, and I've played around with it myself. And um, I think it, 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 there seems to be a pressure there, doesn't there? I agreed, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating to see how different people use that limited number of characters to yeah. describe their entire selves. And some people are a character online, and mm. I'm not. <clears throat> my, my name is my name, and that's that's the things that I do or the things that I do. Uh, uh, and so I see plenty of people who, who... But maybe they still perform as their own name or take photographs as their own name, but they... they they're in character. Yeah. And the Twitter mm. is the kind of introduction to that character. And that's okay. That's an entirely valid way to do it. Um, I, I've done that myself in the past. Um, I, I guess the last few years for me um, have been a process of shaving away those layers of pretense and coming up with the, 
what feels like a real person inside that's what my record's about and uh, i suppose that's what i try to do with my twitter bio to kind of lay it all bare and say there it is that's me um mm, mm. And, and like i'm conscious of how pretentious that sounds saying it now i'm sure everyone tr would say the same about their twitter bio i think that the interesting thing for me is uh, and the reason i'm glad that you asked the question is because i think it's a fascinating discipline to be able to write something about yourself in however many limited number of characters it is um i, I mean I, I think about it a lot i put a lot of time into it so it's kind of nice that someone would notice that and uh, yeah, yeah um i i agree i think it is it is um it, it's an interesting exercise there's a um well he's former curator of the new york public library paul holden graber and um you know if you listen to any of his interviews with 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 celebrities what he does is he opens the interview by asking them to describe themselves in seven words or less. Oh, shit, man. So, okay. <laughs> can you have a go? Bro, that's impossible. I mean, I, I've got musician, songwriter, filmmaker and photographer, haven't I? So, uh, <laughs> How many have you got left? <laughs> that's only four words and uh, another three. Uh, I, I mean, I think Mr. Alec David Bowman, uh, master of nothing. That's well, brilliant. <laughs> You've got one more word. I love that idea. That, that's a great concept. Though. Uh, describe mm. yourself in seven words. What a brutal thing to do. But he, also he, asked, beautiful. he asked that Mike Tyson as well. And I can't remember what Mike Tyson said, but I think he, um, he probably quoted Cicero. Wow. <laughs> Seriously, if you can listen, yeah. to that, listen to that interview between Holden Grabber and Mike Tyson, it's, it's quite brilliant, really. Um, so you've got one more word, and I'll ask you at the end of the podcast what that word I've, is. I've got a pen here. I actually <laughs> jot down some ideas for it. Yeah. <laughs> you can't rush these things, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. Now you've got all the time in the podcast. Well, maybe, maybe the word should be slow then. <laughs> slow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Summing up what we do in market speak, I, I think we're kind of getting on to my next question there, which is something about market speak. Um, and yeah, this kind of pressure to, to sum up. When you do so many different things, um, for example, your photography um, is something that's um, captured my attention on Twitter. And I think I'm not alone there. I think it's, um, it's really innovative and creative what you're doing, the way that you are um, curating a narrative as well there seems to me to be a sort of process of um, layering going on there where you're say taking an album or a song and then you're creating another narrative out of it it's almost like a meta narrative going on there and then that's kind of amplified by the dissemination of that on social media what would you say <laughs> I, yeah i mean that's a, is that's it too a... early for this <laughs> It's an interesting sentence. I, I, I feel a little bit ill-qualified to comment. Um, I, I recognise what you're saying. I think, um, you know, I have, a, I have a way that I work. I'm, I'm, I've been using Twitter for a very long time. I, um, it, it's all very conscious. I sort of feel like I know what I'm doing vaguely. Uh, market speak is, is an interesting phrase to you. It's not one I thought of before you wrote it here um i think all of the disciplines that i work in have their own version of market uh, uh market speak so as a musician there's a certain way you're supposed to talk about yourself it's the same with directors it's the same with uh photography as well there is a way you're supposed to do it and that's part of what master of nothing was intended to do is to kind of make a feature of the rejection of needing to do those things so I, i'm not i don't just take pictures i enjoy making films as well it's a completely different discipline if i'm going to do a, a still photo shoot then it's pretty much gonna need to be that we focus on achieving that if, if we want to make a film we'll have to do that in another time with a different set of uh, requirements and things that we need to do and think about while we're doing it so i can't do the market speak line for all four things so I choose to get around that by kind of referencing one thing within the other. I, mm. I might be a more successful photographer in a studio session because I'm a musician who's been in a recording studio. So I know I can't just stay in there. I'll have five minutes while the engineer sets up the microphones for the take to take pictures in the room. And then I'll need to leave. Otherwise, I'm going to be eaten into your time. So I don't know, that's market speak for how I can be a successful uh, photographer. But it kind of cross-pollinates into musicians. I I've just told you in my photography market speak that I'm a musician as 
well. So if you are looking for a session guitarist, then we can talk. Mm, so yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I feel like I feel like I have the thing that I do, and it it's a there's some fairly complicated relationships within it. But I feel a bit like I'm going to struggle to intellectualize it above that. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's let's talk a bit about where you are now. Can you tell me um, what's the view? Oh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I am facing a wall which has got a blank <laughs> Skype session. And if I look out the window, there's a, a kind of crappy, broken wooden fence and then next door's house a couple of metres away with the sun glaring in between. Um, I, I'm actually not on the Isle of Butte at the moment. I'm in a house in the, in the, in the middle of Nottinghamshire. So, uh, yeah, that's where I am now. <laughs> wow, OK. Um, and that that's... Um... My, my home city as well so uh, I think we we talked a little bit about that before but um yeah the Midlands what well, what well, just just touching on on um, the election again what's the kind of climate there oh, it's like fucked like everywhere else. <laughs> um, how how, um, how are people feeling about about the result around you there I mean I'm in an area which has had a Tory MP for a long time okay yeah so he, he extended his majority yeah. to 70,000, mm -hmm. and that's not a surprise. And I'm, I'm feeling pretty shit about that. But, um, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty jaded at the whole thing. I'm, I'm a little sick of everyone's hot takes on what went wrong. No one knows that yet. It's, it's all pretty pretty jaded I need yeah. to sort of leave it alone yeah 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 well, I think we've, we've, we've entered into the well it started straight away the, the, the blame you know who's to blame and, yeah. and that, that will yeah. continue for some time I'm sure so um, bringing us out of Nottinghamshire let's come back to the Isle of Bute um, how did you yeah. end up there? Oh, well, um, so that is where Josie and Clara lives. Um, and so basically her and I split our time between the two places. Ah. Um, she um, she lived in London and then she left. For, yeah, well, she wrote a whole album about leaving London. <laughs> <coughs> Pretty famously did that. Uh, and I, I kind of, uh, I joined her up there. We'll, we'll, be, ah. we'll be back up on the Isle of Butte for, uh, for a few days, uh, for a few weeks over Christmas. Yeah. So we're going to be there. And, so how does... And it's, it's, Sorry, go on. Oh, I, I was just going to say that, that it, it's, it's beautifully separated. It's so far away mm. and, and kind of remote. Everything's so clean. And, and you know, it isn't, a, uh, isn't quite clean in the way that people think that it is. It's uh, Rothsey, you know, in its own beautiful way. Rothsey's a bit of a shithole. Uh, I mean, I say that with as much love as it's possible to imbue that word with um you know it's it's a kind of a it's a quite poor place there's a lot of uh, closed down shop fronts in rossi um but it's got a real spirit to it like anything could happen there and uh that that's kind of one of the things i like about it is that it's not just it's not like a bucolic vision of rolling fields and locks it's got a little bit of grit about it too in the same yeah. way glasgow has yeah um, yeah mm -hmm. and i consider glasgow to be a sort of a second or third home i lived there for a year and it's a it's it's a beautiful city yeah and then rossi is like kind of a little installation of uh glasgow just a bit further away which Mm, which works mm. for me. Yeah, when I visited Mount Stewart, I obviously went over on the ferry, and um, it, it, there's something about that travelling across, you know, over the water, and then you're separate. And I'm just wondering about making music in that context where you kind of left the city and then you're uh, surrounded by... I, can't, I don't know whether island mentality is, is the right thing, because that's obviously a very subjective thing, but being surrounded physically by water, there's so many artists, of course, folk singers, Sandy Denny and um, Jenny Mitchell, that, that use water as metaphor or have talked a lot about the influence of being near the sea upon their music. Has, yeah, yeah. has, it, has it kind of changed your songwriting in any way or come into it yeah that's that's a really interesting question and I, I feel a bit like i agree with all that stuff i i know um i've seen and when when i spend time on the island we meet artists and other musicians who, who work in that way I'm, I'm not certain that it has bled into what i've written about what the, the the album that i've made is a real specific cycle of songs about a, a kind of my emotional journey <laughs> my emotional journey um over the last few years and i did write some of that while i was on the island but i don't think it's about the island in, mm. at all what i wonder is the, how, how much that bleeds into future stuff i think i think it is impossible to not feel 
I don't know if the right word is inspired, but just affected by a place like the Isle of Bute. Mm. It, it's, it kind of gets inside you. And songs are always imbued with a sense of place. The, the songs about uh, on my album are imbued with a really different sense of place to that. They, they all happen inside a tiny pressure cooker. Um, but yeah, I, I, do, I do love songs about the sea. And I think uh, Bute is an especially beautiful place to have some of that. Yeah, um, I, I f- I'm thinking about where the singer is when they sing. So this idea of where the singer is located, if we take a case study like Bon Eva, um, going away mm. to, you know, make work in a cabin, write songs in a cabin, that kind of Theroian sort of escape. I mean, I'm not pro it myself in the sense that I haven't... I, I'm just not sure... Um, I think there's like an artifice about it. And I think if you're... You know, you you create and you're writing songs. You're doing it wherever you are. See, yeah, I, I feel I feel a little cynical about that, and I I know the the bon Iver story, and and that's great. He he managed to make that work, and I don't doubt that it was all true. Um, I, I remember the record came out, and that was the bit that everyone was interested in. I mean, I, I wrote some of my record in a in a shipping container in London. Yeah. Um, I wrote some of it in a hotel room in Basingstoke. It, it's not an album about being in a hotel in Basingstoke, though. Um, I, 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 you know, there's this American tradition where it's pretty difficult to find a, a, a record that doesn't have the name of a place yeah. uh, in the title. Um, you know, we, we like sh- show me a, a, an American roots album that hasn't got a song about Tallas, Tallahassee or the Mississippi. You know, yeah. that's that's great, and I, I listen to that kind of music all of the time. The, this this was a different time. This album that I've made was different to that. I I haven't got a song about being in a shipping container in Boston or in, in uh, a premiere in in Basingstoke. Although you know, maybe that would be an interesting second album. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love premiere inns. Yeah, did I tell you about my premiere in stay in Helensborough? No, I didn't. No, um, no. I made work out of it. It was a photo- photographic um, series called Hotel Works, where I just played around with props in the room. But it did get me thinking about um, recording in in hotel rooms, and then I started thinking about Leonard Cohen and songs from a room um, and that cool. that tradition. And I think there's something in that. But I suppose what I'm more interested in is liminal spaces and um, these you know transitory spaces, as opposed to some idealized kind of temporary utopia like a, a hut in a in a wood. I mean, Theroux had his mother, you know, yeah, I, kind of supporting him. Right. The, the, yeah, yeah. I, I've always been a little cynical about that. I'll, I'll give you an example. So, um, let's say that um, I get a house and uh, it's got a dining room and a living room and then a spare room downstairs. Okay, well, what we can do is we can like furnish that. We can make it into the music room. We've got more space than ever before. We can have keyboards and cellos and double basses and guitars all over the place. And we can have like a our own like a, instead of just a tiny laptop, we can like make a you know get a get an actual PC and a mixing desk and and then I find that you're in a space that you can't think of anything to say in. Yeah. And, and, you know, my best lyrics come to me in the shower or on a train. And those aren't, those aren't, it's not because there's some special spiritual experience being had. It's just because that seems to be where my brain can rest and it can come up with a sentence that says the thing that I'm looking for in my song. And so, I, I'm, you know, again, I, with the Bonnie Vare example, I don't mean to pick on him. He makes great music, but... Um, I know that I couldn't just take all my equipment to a cabin in the woods and then make a record. Um, I, you know, I, I feel I feel like that just wouldn't work for me. And and you know, it's interesting you talked about premier ins. I I kind of feel like uh, I had this idea where um, I might do a a, a, a tour of premier ins. Yeah. Imagine you know you can oh, I love play it. at the harvest <laughs> and the uh, the football comes on, but they have to turn it off because you know half eight. This guy is going to get up and sing some really sad songs to uh, a couple of disinterested <laughs> businessmen. <laughs> I, I think that's resistance. That's like you're really good. That, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it'll be a horrible experience, but I think it'll be funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, right. Where am I now? So, um, storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about 
presence on social media um, and using social media as a form of storytelling in a way. How does storytelling come into your songwriting? Do you see yourself as a songwriter who's telling stories? Yeah, I mean, I love that question too. Um, so, yeah, um, every everything on the record that I have just finished making and you'll get to hear soon is all real. That is me. Yeah, happened to me. Those were my feelings as I had those things happen. So I, I struggle to consider it to be an album of stories because it's just too close. I, that said, I have absolutely been... Um, in the past in bands where every single song is is a is a made up character and then that character has an experience and the experience the character has is a thing that i kind of want to say so it's not really much different but it feels a bit like hiding behind a tail that i can say oh no it's not me that feels that way it's the barman in the song and and that that feels that that stopped feeling entirely authentic and I wanted this to be as, as raw an experience as I could make it. I wanted you to hear how vulnerable and broken I was. And then I wanted you to hear why I didn't feel that way anymore. Mm. So I suppose that, you know, my, the reality of, of me being alive and moving about the world is that I am subject to the story of my own life, um, just like everyone else's. Um, but I tried not to hide behind anything this time and and that that can be difficult to do it it feels a bit um it feels pretty exposing it feels it feels pretty vulnerable there's a couple of tracks on the record where i'm pretty nervous i feel like if a reviewer says oh this is terrible i just don't quite know how i will cope with that i don't have a layer of protection yeah <laughs> it's it's not like an experience that happened to someone else and uh i mean maybe that makes it good storytelling um, or, or maybe it doesn't. I guess time will tell. Mm. You know, so there are, you know, singers like Joni Mitchell or even John Morland, you know, and, and they play around with going... I'd say with Joni Mitchell, primarily, uh, she can go into character. Obviously, Joni Mitchell is Joni Mitchell, but um, the way she did it was so skilled because, you know, you, you still really wanted to um, connect with that. But... Yeah. being able to sing from other characters' points of view, it's not something that a lot of sing-songwriters actually can do that well. I don't think. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. And I think it... Um, I, I did an interview just a couple of weeks ago where that question came out and, and someone said to me, so is, 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 is this you or are you sort of singing mm. this from someone else's point of view? And I said, oh, no, no, it's all me. And they said, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so bored. <laughs> oh singers saying to me oh yeah no i wrote this song about a character i invented i mean i, I don't care about that i want yeah. i want to know about you is what yeah. this interviewer said to me and uh, i thought that was a really fascinating take on it and and it was interesting uh, interesting to hear that like voice out loud um mm. I'm, I'm not sure i make that distinction when i listen to music i i you know i, I can listen to Joni mitchell and i can hear what a magician she is mm. and flicking between uh, her, her perspective and her point of yeah, view, yeah. and and I can hear John Mullen sing about um, how he's he's too heavy to love and like you know he just sort of reduced to see to a blubbering mass on the floor, um, and and I think it either works or it doesn't. And some people, it's obvious that the reason it doesn't work is because they're just making up a thing and writing it down badly. Um, so, so I'm, I'm not sure the distinction is between people that write character and don't write mm. character. I think that both things can be done well. I was at a crit group um, at Glasgow. We we set up this this group for practice research PhDs, and we were talking about um, truth. Truth came up, and I was just faced by this room of people that looked at me when I said the, said the word truth. I was talking about songwriting, and what I said was the reason that. You know, we we have this emotional response to a singer-songwriter on a physical level. It's embodied. So when they're singing, there might be something that they're, you know, bringing up in their lyrics or their performance, and we connect to it, yeah. And it's a physical thing, and it's felt inside. And my point was is that I think we're experiencing some kind of truth there, which we know to be truth. Um, and, and they just, yeah, they, they kind of um, asked me to explain myself. Which which was tough. Um, 
but it goes be it goes beyond any kind of intellectualization doesn't it it's an embodied response you might have a lump in your throat you you know uh, even goosebumps these these kind of physical sensations we have when we're faced with a performer that is um opening us up as they go it's um, such a vulnerable place for the for the listener isn't it yeah, I've, I've got an interesting take on that, which is that, um, so I, I work alongside uh, Josie and Clark, um, she, she produced my record, and I work as a guitar tech and uh, tour manager and sort of a general roadie and carrier of things. I do her merch desk as well, so she'll stand up and play an hour's worth of songs, which are all just her solo, intensely personal. Um, she uses her perfect voice to tell her truth. and. My experience of that is that there is a queue of 30 people at the merch desk desperate to take a piece of that away with them. Mm. They, they, they all tell me, I hear, it, I hear it 30 times a night, that this has said something to them, that they have connected with this on a level that they can't explain. Mm. No, one ever, no one ever knows what Josie and all is wants is she wants to hear why, but they just say, I, I, just, I just like, I felt so moved. I felt so connected. You, you just said the thing that I think I could never say so well, and I, I need you to sign this, and I need to, uh, I need to own this piece of you. Oh, um, yeah, that, that's it's, that's it's, wonderful. It's really powerful to, watch. yeah, no, it really is, and and like none of them could could explain it any any better than, than you just did. But <laughs> they experience truth in the a response to what it is she does, and she is a, a, a sort of a, a, an example of someone who's very good at that at capturing those extreme emotional responses with real brevity and class um um yeah and, and like i see it work it, it it's it's actually it actually connects and they mm. like they, they they yeah i talk to them every night so is that do, do you think that involves a kind of restraint you mean on behalf of on behalf shows? of the performer yeah i mean it's the restraint in the performance that means that people that, that it doesn't um, that it delivers but it doesn't overwhelm see I, what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna bring this back to being about me um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a like massive narcissist obviously or i wouldn't be doing this which i think is part of the answer to this question so yeah i, I, I can stand up in front of a crowd of people and i could just stand there and like cry and they would all feel awkward and leave um or I could take a deep breath and then I could share with them a thing that I had been working on for a year. And my hope would be that some of them said, oh, wow, yeah, I know what you mean, man. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that too sometimes. I, I, don't, I don't need to teach anything. I don't need to give them an answer. I just need to try and sum it up. And in order to do that, absolutely, I have to be restrained. I can't just stand there and blub. That doesn't work. Um, so yeah, re restraint in order to be able to tell the truth in that kind of way is an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. There's a quote um, I wanted to just raise with you um, off your website. Alec works best untethered and free to be formal or filthy with impunity and enjoys natural light and twists on classic themes, but most of all, loves to tell stories with whatever he's working with at the time, be it songs, still photography or moving pictures. This way of working is important to you, yeah? And yeah. yeah. Wh why is that? Is this, this, this being untethered? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's another fascinating question. I feel a bit like it, I'm full just, of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I kind of. I mean, I wrote this. I'll tell you what. Right. Let me give you an example. I wrote that on my website because I found myself making a music video for someone. It was all really last minute. We had a plan. The plan didn't work. We were foiled by equipment and weather and the logistics of it, which is often the way making a video is pretty logistics heavy, and nothing that we thought of worked. We just shot some footage and i said well okay look you know if, if this is all we can do then this is all we can do and so i thought well what we it's plenty of times you see a music video and what you get is just a nice picture of a tree with a person standing next to it blowing in the wind for three minutes cool i'm i'm not even against that kind of thing i quite like it but you know what i can't i can't seem to do it 
I, I need I need there to be I need there to be a point. If if I'm going to spend some time making it, then we have to go somewhere. We need a start and a middle and an end. There's got to be some tension from mm. somewhere. However small it is, there has to be this sense of there being a point. What am I trying to say? If I'm not trying to say anything, then I feel like I just may as well not bother making it at all. And I guess um, you know I've I've certainly been involved in projects in the past where that hasn't been the case. Where I, I've I mean, I used to be in a band called Formication. We released records that had 25-minute long songs that had no movement of any kind, just one long echo note. And plenty of people found lots to like in that. And at the time, that was satisfying to do. But I feel like um, the phase that I'm in at the moment is that, yeah, um, storytelling seems to be the theme that I'm trying to pull out in in the case of that particular video i shot a bit more footage after trying to edit together a story with what i had so i knew in the second shoot that i needed to establish this and to show that and to tell this and so that's why i shot i put it together and then we ended up with, with the film so um yeah i'm not sure i know what the answer to the question why is it important other than it just is it's mm. really important and i can't do it if it's not there mm, mm. Um, you talked a little bit about tension there. Does there have to be a sort of narrative tension? Does the does the visual have to sort of reflect? I suppose what I'm trying to ask here, and I'm not doing it very well. How does the how do the visual choices or the visual narrative reflect the narrative in the song? Yeah, do you want I them mean, to match that, in that's... mirror or? They do. Um, h how do they? <laughs> Is again, it's a question <laughs> that I'm not certain I have the vocabulary or um, uh, understanding to answer well. Uh, if I take the last video that I made as an example, uh, it was for a, a really short two minute long song called Host, which was about kind of being in a, a, in a, in a sort of trapped in a situation that wasn't comfortable. It, it didn't it didn't try to escape. It, it just said, uh, you know, I, I'm just a host. And so I, I came up with a storyboard for that video and I took some sh shots for that video. I knew that I wanted to unsettle the viewer. I knew that the song had some, some real surprises, some bits where there was nothing. And then there was like a kind of a cascade of volume and noise and sounds. And I wanted to do that um, visually as well. I wanted to tie the two th things together. But but I also wanted the viewer to be as unsettled by the song as they were by the uh, video. So I, I f what I what I found was that the fluorescent light in the venue that we were using, um, fluorescent lights are interesting visually anyway. And you know when you kind of turn them on and they don't come on straight away, they kind of flicker a bit. Um, yeah. The first time I did that, I thought, okay, well this is this is kind of horrible. This is a lot like that bit in the song where it goes boom. And so I shot quite a bit of that and I built the narrative around it. The narrative in that video kind of goes that um, we start off in the darkness and then there's a person there telling us what's happened to them and we end up with them kind of s glancing, scared, looking really scared, glancing upwards. Um, and then the lights go back back out again and it's supposed to be claustrophobic um so there's there's tension there's a there's a, a there's a narrative arc it's a small one it's not like i'm trying to tell you a shakespearean play it's a it's a minor um act but it is it does go somewhere it has a beginning mm. and a middle and, a, and the visual elements match the song and that's another thing i actually had a brief from someone where they said that they wanted me to make them a video before they had the song and I said, well, then you need someone else. I simply can't do that. <laughs> it's not possible. Like without, without, um, without the recording, then they're no, no, I'm not interested. I yeah. don't. And, and can I ask, how they, do you, they how, kind of went, yeah, yeah. So how do you edit in terms of rhythm? Um, is it important for you that the, or how do you kind of work with the rhythm of the song in terms of editing visual images? Yeah, um, one thing I don't know is I have no idea what the rules are about that kind of thing, but I do know when it's right and when it's not. So what I find is that the rhythm is really important, and what you could do is you could um, you could make a cut on the one, the one. <laughs> but then someone someone's chopping kind of edge. Unpredictable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah.
yeah, yeah. It, it, it's kind of, I, I mean, I do it in a host song a couple of times and um, where I kind of try to cut away where you're definitely not, not expecting the video to cut away. Um, you, you know, halfway through a bar or halfway through a sentence or mm. just when there's about to be an important word. No, no, we're going to leave now. I'm trying to pull the carpet out from under your feet or mm. the tablecloth or whatever. And, and so you, you have to understand the rhythm of the song. And then I think that you can ignore it completely um i'm working on one at the moment like that which is a really metronomic piece of music and and i started off cutting it in a metronomic way because i thought that it would match and what i found was that no your your brain starts to expect the image to change and then you, you kind of start to anticipate what it'll change to and it's not interesting anymore so it, it felt like in that example the more metronomic the song the less metronomic the edit had to be um but I think instinct is what that comes down to. Yeah. I mean, and, and there are people who say, oh, I hate this music video you made. It's terrible. And, and that, okay, so it's it's not supposed to be something that everybody will like. No, oh, never is going to be that. Um, you know, my instinct creates the art that it creates. And if that lands, then it lands. If we think about a video, music video, like um, we've got a mutual love of Will Oldham, Bonnie Prince Billy um, in... in uh, I See a Darkness, that song. And I'm thinking about the music video. Do you know the one I'm talking about? I do, I do, I do. Yeah, so I love that video. Do you know why I love it? You mean the one where his eyes are all weird? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a great video, isn't it? Tell me why you love it. No, you tell me why I love it. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess um, for me, what I think is that it is a wonderfully, there's a word I'm looking for, there's like disrespect it's yeah it's kind of it's hilariously disrespectful of the source material he's not taking himself even slightly exactly. seriously <laughs> it, it kind of leaves you feeling all queasy like what the hell i think it's so clever because it creates that disjunction you sort of because especially when you know the original and then you're thinking you know also johnny cash but and, and yeah. the gravitas of that song um, which is of uh, such a wonderful song um, and then to play around with those emotions I've become more interested in visual in visuals music videos what, what's coming across you know if it has a sense of humor it's in juxtaposition or opposition to the to the melancholy feel or nature of the song yeah. and yeah and there's something there's something in that um, that I think is very interesting, thinking about my own songwriting, my debut album, where it's quite a, a sombre album, and um, and the melodies and the lyrics are mutually sombre. And there's not really anywhere else for the listener to go. But when you bring in humour and kind of juxtaposition and play, like he does so well in that video, um, yeah, it yeah. sort of disjoints us, doesn't it? I, I think, um, you know, Will's extremely good at that. He'll, he'll throw in a swing a word where you're really not expecting him to in a completely inappropriate place and and you, you sort of recoil from that what the hell is he doing but um you remember it and you'll sing along yeah. with it and play it again for sure uh yeah yeah he's he's very he's very good at that indeed <laughs> you put a tweet out on the 2nd of december i'm not stalking your twitter account or anything um but uh, it was the producer just called my song mad mathematics sweet <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. What did he mean by yeah, they, that? They were, they were talking about a song called Leaves from my album where um, I'd written um, I'd written four guitar parts and they, they I can't play them all at once. They kind of joined together. So I, I could record it myself on, the, on my phone and, and, and what it tried to do was to kind of play with the... You know how you get Olympic guitar players, uh, sort of superstar folk guitarists who can who can kind of finger style like it was a showcase um and be like brilliantly uh sort of throwing in plucked harmonics and like amazing kind of technique well i mean that's all fine I, I'm, I'm pleased that those people exist and um, but i don't play that way uh, I, i'm a kind of a rudimentary guitarist um and i love I like songs rather than technique, but um, for this particular song, I, I'd kind of written the uh, I'd written the words, and then the melody was pretty plain, and so I wanted to do something with the guitar. And what I did with the guitar was I wrote some interlocking pieces of guitar music where I tried to play with the time signature. So I tried to put. I I, I also lack the vocabulary and the technical training to be able to explain what it does but i tried to kind of put 
one bar starting halfway through the uh, bar of the bit underneath. So it kind of, uh, the time rolled in a strange way. And uh, I knew that it would go four bars of this, four bars of this, four bars of this, and then it would change. And it would be really particular all the way through the song. And it's really short, it's only three minutes long. I went into the studio with a very, very prescriptive way that I wanted this to work. And I wanted to do this, I wanted to kind of pull off this timing trick. And, and that's what they were referring to. They, they said, well, I don't, you know, I do have, have the musical training and vocabulary to explain this. And I don't even really know what you mean. This is crazy. What, what are you trying to achieve? And I, I could sing it and I could tap. I, I couldn't really say what it was I wanted. And, you know, uh, we managed to do it. That they, they kind of got, they, they understood what I was trying to achieve. And uh, I recorded all the parts and we layered them together. And that particular song ended up with an entire woodwind orchestra on it as well, kind of picking out my my mad mathematics. <laughs> and uh, It's a very, very good yeah, um, that, that's album that's, title, that one, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I, well, it's an interesting thing that you say, is that I find that if, if you, um, you probably have this too, uh, like a notebook somewhere on your person where you'll be uh, just like walking down the street and someone will say something and you'll uh, think, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting idea, um, a great little sentence, a nice image, I'm going to capture it for later. I, you know, I do find myself like looking back over over tweets and then saying, yeah, you know, I remember tweeting that thing about it. What was the phrase they used? And uh, going back to try and find it. it. It works a bit like a notebook. Um, I use it as a sort of archive in a way. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Time. Songwriting. I came across a quote by Gillian Welsh, who, you know, another... Um, major influence mine and she's asked what do you think your music has to offer people and she answered in a way um, that, that I thought I might bring into our chat today she said people don't change and it absolutely stops the clock and they the songs do this wonderful thing they make time non-existent to me it's the exact opposite of making the clock tick hmm. what do you think to that I mean I, I, I adore that quote and I think that there's no one as good at that as uh, Gillian Welsh. She, she's um, she, she's a genius at doing that. I don't mean the, I don't mean the timelessness. I mean, you, if you listen to her records, they they could have been recorded in the twenties. Um, but she she's and it's very uh, what's like the right word. It's kind of so bittersweet and melancholic the way she tells tells things in songs. Her her albums are a beautiful comfort blanket. I can't wait for her to uh, reissue Time, the Revelator, because the uh, the material that goes on the remastered version of that is going to be beautiful. Mm. Um, uh, you know, that's a 14 minute long song, and and that's just her and an acoustic guitar. I mean, not many people no. can pull that trick off, no. and and she can because she does exactly that. She she stops that clock and she creates a kind of uh, like a, a blanket around time and you, and uh, it's yeah. A blanket. Right. A blanket, yeah, that's um, like a protection. I, you know, that's what I find. Her, her, her albums are a, a, a comforting listen. They really are. I, my, my listening habits work that way in that I don't... I, I like to listen to lots of stuff. I like to know what, what is going on in the world of music, but I have a very few kind of core of records that I come back to again and again. And, I, you know, I know every note and I can sing along with every word. And that's a really precious thing to me. And uh, Gillian Welsh has got two or three records in that sort of precious little list. And, and that's why they're just so... Um, they'll always be there. I can always, uh, I can always stick everything as free on however however terrible the world might feel and she'll explain to me why it's probably going to be okay <laughs> I, I i love i love the music videos as well and and, and also the way that she portrays herself physically <laughs> on on, on yeah. um uh, there's something very um frail and vulnerable about her persona um <laughs> untouchable as well <laughs> She is, she is, and I think that's part of the blanket thing. She creates an entire world just for herself. You, you, you don't mm. need anything else when you're there. And she can be as vulnerable as she likes, but, but you know that she's got this. And that's kind of what I meant when I said earlier on that it's not going to work. I'm, you know, a performer can't just stand on stage and just cry. I mean, like, if being raw and emotional and real is all there is to it, then anyone could do that. They could stand on a stage and, like, sob 
oh god i feel terrible and by that rationale everyone should say oh this was so relatable i feel terrible too sometimes but you that that's not that's not all there is to it there's there's an there's a there's an art around it and and there's no better example than than gillian's little bubble where you know i mean i you're right her image and the way that she the way that she dresses and the guitars that she chooses and every little decision on her records all of her records i don't think she's ever made a misstep they're all just perfect they all contribute to the idea of the the character called gillian welsh and the stories that that character tells and you know i i'm sure that it's really her and i yeah. don't need to know if it's a uh, hmm. if if we go from um I got you there. No, I just, I just say, I, I kind of went off on a little. Um, <laughs> what did you go off on? What, <laughs> I'm interested in asides and digressions and. Cool. Oh, you're not going to say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, t- from from time to space, I'm going to bring it back to shapes. Do you think there's such a thing as the shape of a song? Yeah, you know, I saw uh, uh, when when we talked about doing this interview, you you mentioned Wolfie's quote about my uh, my my work, where he said uh, that there are uh, concentrated space in the shape of a song. Um, I mean, I, I guess it's it's difficult to not approach this from a sort of a technical point of view and say that a song definitely has a shape, which is that if it doesn't have any words, then it's not a song at all. It's just music. And so if it's going to have words, then you have to start somewhere and it, it's going to need to have the, the characteristics like a chorus or a verse. And um, I don't think that's what this is about, really. I don't, I don't quite think that's what Wolfie means. I think... Um, I, I understand the, the technicalities of songwriting, of creating, uh, you know, tension and release in a song as well. If there's an intro that you hear later on, then it's kind of foreshadowing the story. And when you come back to it, it will feel comforting even on the first listen. I can't help but think that there's something more magical going on, some kind of alchemy here with um, the right chords and the right words and the right notes said in the right way reverberating with the chords and having the notes that you're not singing sounding in between that's my reading of wolfie's quote and i might be uh, disappearing so far up my own ass there that it's meaningless <laughs> but um i mean simply from a technical point of view i'm a fan of traditional um uh, classic i suppose song structures i like a chorus I- i'm working here in um in the kind of the vaguely the folk idiom where it's pretty trendy to say that you know i like a song which is just 25 verses about being a fisherman and i'm all right with songs that do that but no i I like um i like verse chorus verse middle eight chorus and and i feel that this is a shameful thing that that shape of song exists for a reason. I like to, um, when I'm playing live, I like to say that, you know, I, I wrote this as a sing-along. It was meant to be um, Africa by Toto. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not, and no one's going to sing along with it because it doesn't come out that way when I sing. Um, that's just my lot, and I'm all right with it. But, you know, I, I think I think those, I, I spend a lot of time, and a couple of people that have heard my record have talked about how they like the simple arrangements. And yeah, it's really simple. Um, <laughs> you know, I start the song, I say the thing I need to say, and then the song finishes. There aren't any solos. There's not any big overblown instrumental breaks, any halftime sections. It's really simple, but it's deliberately simple. Um, yeah. Mm, trying to get to something. How does it come out when you sing? You said that's not how it comes out when I sing. But- yeah, that's a, that's a that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, uh, what what I always think is that you know I, I like to um, I love to sing. Singing is a thing I've done since I was born. Uh, singing in church with my granddad, singing hymns, um, going on to being in a school band, and you know some people they open their mouth, then like the world stops to listen to the sound of their voice, even if what they're saying is total horseshit. And I I, I kind of equally envy and resent those people. Um, you know, my, I don't have that kind of voice. It's not a beautiful voice. I've had I've had comparisons to, to uh, Leonard Cohen and to Shane McGowan, 
and you know those people are pretty pretty detuneful they're pretty flat singers i don't have a wide range i've got like three notes that work the rest they tend to get a bit kind of twisty um so i have to i have to focus on writing with what i have and yeah no one's gonna listen to my record and say what a beautiful singing voice is like an angel <laughs> It's just not uh, yeah, be yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but you, you put something out on Twitter about um, the English uh, Council House Leonard Cohen. If, if <laughs> yeah. you wrote that, then I would want to hear the English Council House Leonard Cohen. I would. See, that's that's the trick I find, which is that what I have to accept is that you know I don't sing like, and I'm not going to name any names, but I could I could point at hundreds of singers who can open their mouth and sound like a singer is supposed to, and because of that, they can write a song that does nothing it adds nothing it says nothing and they can sell a million copies and i don't resent them that i'm i'm comfortable with my place in it which is that it doesn't sound i mean so i've been in the studio and i know how many takes it, it takes to get you know a good enough one that we can use of my songs and uh i'm, I'm okay with that i'm resigned to that um hey i know i need to tell you a thing right so my favorite ever review of um one of my records was um, by a guy called Alan, and he he said, uh, you know, I got this this album by this singer called Alec Bowman, and uh, oh man, he's so raw, and uh, you know what a singing voice. He like really, you know, he's got this great voice where you just believe everything he says, and he's a wonderful <laughs> lyricist, and I loved his album, and so I took it on holiday, and it was a driving holiday, just me and my wife drove around the Lake District for two weeks from campsite to campsite. And this was the only CD I had. And I was, uh, I was in heaven. You know, I know every word on your songs. I feel this stuff, man, it's so raw. My wife's not talking to me anymore, though. She basically can't stand the sound. Um, <laughs> and I thought this was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. And I said, like, I'm, I'm so sorry that, you know, you, <laughs> you're connecting with this music and that I don't have the voice to bring your wife along on the journey. Um, <laughs> You've caused marital friction. <laughs> I, you know, I can't, I can't feel responsible for that. It was his decision to do. But yeah, I mean, so, I, you know, I know it tends to split a room. And when I, I say the council house Cohen, that's kind of a snappy phrase that will make people interested. And uh, so, yeah, I, I feel like I, I, I push really hard on the writing. Um, you know, I've, I've got things that I want to say. So I try to write them as well as I can. And, and I present them in the voice that I have. And can that's you, why I do. Um, that, that's can why you, I do, yeah. Can you tell me, just straight off, give me a lyric off your new album? I mean, uh, I think it was you who highlighted one particular line that I'm really, I don't know that I can say proud of, but um, there's, there's a line, uh, which song is it even in? I think it's in uh, a song called A Ditch Worth Dying For, where I say, I never missed you more than when you were there. And like wh when I consider like what that means, what a terrible thing to say that is. Then then yeah that that I mean and I I know what I'm I know what I'm doing there. I I wrote that to be. I didn't write it to be hurtful or harm someone, but it is how I felt, and yeah, I feel like that's that's a that's one I'd hold up. In. It also speaks of a loneliness, doesn't it? within within a marriage or within a relationship that you can experience how terrible that you can be so alone when you're with someone mm. more alone than if you were just by yourself existing in the way that you would yeah but you're so separated by being around a person that it's more lonely i mean damn your demo for ditch i had a look at that you kindly sent me your material um prior to the podcast thank you again um uh, yeah. again a very cohen leonard cohen -y vibe about that i i really like this song and the the, uh, the feel of it as well thank you that's okay i was just thinking could you could you tell us just a little bit about ditch a bit more about it and sort of where it came from in terms of the song where did the song come from yeah, well, uh, uh, where did the song come from? I, that, I always, I always struggle to answer that because, um, I mean, if if I think back to where it came from, then it came from the first line was the first thing I had. I love closing doors, and 
I think, I mean, I don't know how obvious it is in the song, but I, I don't love them. Um, I love closing doors, self-harming in bars, proving my scars are deeper than yours. I, I, I don't love those things. Who would ever love those things? Nobody, surely. So I was, I, the, the, that particular verse goes on with a list of other things that I really don't love, but things that I found myself doing anyway. So it was a pretty deeply personal place to write from. And I think the reason that it comes over as pretty Leonard Coney is I, I talked earlier on about having having a relatively narrow range. There's not many notes I can sing, and all the ones I can are there in the verse of ditch. I sort of um, there's not much melodic variation. It, it's sticks at one kind of pitch, well, two pitches. Um, so it's pretty downbeat. It's pretty more. It creates a fairly. Um, it creates a fairly kind of sad introspective little place from a song to come from and then i tried to sort of i tried to break that in the in the chorus and it's a little bit more animated and the the, the pitches are a little higher and the melody is a little freer and in the recorded version there is um there's the there's the acoustic guitar part but there's also some electric guitar and there's a really interesting saxophone line and then some bass guitar too so it all gets just a little bigger um and and again that that dynamic changes between the verse and the chorus where the cor uh, the verse stays really down and then uh, the the chorus kind of, kind of tries to lift that up a bit it's one of those where i would say hey this is a real sing along chorus everyone join in now um but of course it's not a celebration of a song it's um it's it's pretty angry i mean i i, I feel like uh, I, I quite like angry music but to, to some people, angry music is sort of just sweary metal. I feel like that's fine, and it's not a genre I really listen to, but I don't mind it being there. I think Ditch is, is, is angry in a different way. Um, I, was, I was trying to trying to expose the reasons I felt angry, um, put them out on the table and, and, and deal with the place that I was in at the time. So, mm-hmm. Are there any songs on the new album that you find more are there any that you find difficult to perform or sing <laughs> yeah that, which that's, ones that's, and why there there really is you know there's one in particular and you know i, I didn't i didn't anticipate this uh, you, you you've been in a recording studio you you understand the experience of that where you put um you put a year or more into writing music and you get to know every note but before the recording studio, it's all uh, it's all a theoretical exercise in making it as good as you can. Um, then, then, and playing a gig is different again. So you know, you touched on this earlier on. A, a gig is a performance. There's a theatre to it. You can hide slightly behind the stage lights, and you just deliver the song. But in the studio, there's nowhere to hide. You are under the microscope. There is a scalpel paused just above your vocal cords getting ready to slice into them and get the best take of a song. And there was one song on the record, which um, is called Patience, which is the halfway point. And, do you know, it was it was so hard to do. I, I don't even really remember getting a good take of it. I, I struggled to make it through it. it it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a personal piece of writing. Um, it's kind of a turning point in the journey. It's the bit where resolution arrives and we know we need to change. So change. And it's it's a kind of, it felt really bold. I felt like I was saying like, oh, I'm going to take this situation by the scruff of its neck and, and make it what I want it to be. Under the, um, under the harsh lights of the studio, I could barely deliver it. And I mean, I feel now like listening back to the mixes the album that that one is a pretty painful moment um it's not the most confident vocal delivery on the record it, it's it's a it's a pretty vulnerable place and i think i said this on twitter as well where i said i i kind of felt like a really big dog on a beach kind of you know barking around and everyone else was thinking wow he's really changing he's so powerful and then i looked to myself in this situation and i just realized that actually i was tiny i was nothing I'm like yapping at my lead, trying to take on all the others and uh, f- feeling like all of a sudden I've got the perspective of looking in from the outside and realizing how powerless I really am. 
<laughs> so yeah, there's there was that one. Mm. Alec, how far have you come since the self-released Wild Man of Europe? Yeah, how far have I come? I mean, that was a long time ago. Um, I think everything is different now. There's, there's really nothing about my life which is the same, and there's nothing about my music. Um, every <clears throat> every song on the Wild Man album was was acting. I was trying to deliver messages from the point of other characters. I was trying to tell people things with my lyrics and that no one ever heard. And and what I'm doing now is I'm just telling them. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You, we talked a little bit about John Morland um, in, a, in a message a bit back. Uh, I just want to know where you were when you saw him perform. And I was really touched by how you brought that experience to life and I just I just thought it would be lovely for the podcast if you'd do that again for us ha huh, okay yeah no that's um, I mean I'd love to um, that was uh, end of the road the end of the road festival in 2016 whichever year John Mullen played in the afternoon on the garden stage anyway um, oh yeah I mean what what a, what a beautiful performer John was. It was it was a rainy day and there weren't many people on the field. And and John is a very big man and he needed help to get to his and he didn't really say a word. I don't think he did say a word to the audience. He didn't speak. He just sat and played his songs with his uh, acoustic guitar. And they were mostly from high on Tulsa Heat. And I, I I stood on the barrier with, um, I don't know, 10 other people. And then there were probably a couple of hundred other people sitting in chairs and with umbrellas behind me. And I, I don't think many people that were there weren't like openly weeping at what he was doing, um, which was he, he was just telling us that, you know, he, he felt like a burden to people, but that there were people who accepted him for what he for what he is and he was grateful to those people for being there and i'm not sure i've ever seen that as well done live as as john did it that day and i think that it was it was a transcendental experience i, I really felt that um i mean that, that was it was i wasn't in a great place at the time <laughs> and i suppose my record is uh is is gives a little bit of background into into where I was when I saw him do that. And it was a huge inspiration to me, his performance at that festival. Um, just just to be so vulnerable and then to do that in such a brave way. He, he Again, it's like you said uh, earlier on, he didn't just get on the stage and go, oh God, I feel really unhappy. I'm going to play my songs. He, he delivered them with defiance that you could hear catching in his throat when he didn't really believe it. But he was trying to convince himself that, you know, there were people that loved him anyway. And, and he was grateful to those people. And, and that message where you don't feel good enough, but like, what if you are anyway? And what if a few people can recognize that you don't need hundreds of friends you don't need friends that tell you that you know you're, you're amazing and then go on to shit on you behind your back you you just need someone to understand and you just need to be able to be your your, your real self the actual you and then if you can get appreciated for that if that can be the thing that's validated then you know maybe that will be okay and that's that's what john sat there and said and i i've never seen that so viscerally done as him being helped to his seat telling us where he was in his life and then uh, and then leaving again so yeah end of the road mm. whichever Gosh, the, the, there's so much in there my brain's just like uh, latching on to so much of what you're saying then <laughs> wanted to come back i'm wondering that defiance that visceral kind of defiance there and um, is that what you're trying to do see yeah, that that's kind of um, that's kind of what I was saying when I talked about my song. We're trying and to record my song, Patience. I felt like what I was doing there was a similar thing to John at uh, End of the Road, or at least the motivation was the same. I'm, I'm not comparing my work to it, but I I felt like it was a defiant moment. I um, the, the chorus in my song, Patience, says, "When you're next to nothing, with 
nothing to lose. You get carried away. Patience, the truth. And, and I was meaning that to be defiant. I felt like that was a moment that people would be able to say, yeah, oh, how inspiring. And then, and then when I said it in the studio and when I played it back, I thought, oh, oh God, no, this just sounds like someone who's broken. <laughs> this, this sounds like defeat. And so, yeah, I, I, I kind of, uh, I think maybe I flattened myself that I was doing a similar thing. To, to, to John Morland um, at the end of the road. But whether or not I've pulled it off, I mean, that's not for me to judge, I suppose. Um, I, I, I like that recording and it is what it is. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think about, um, you, you mentioned John Morland there, not, not speaking, not, I'm not saying not interacting because I don't think they're the same thing, but not addressing the audience. I'm thinking about Dylan um, and, and singer-songwriters um, and the way that they interact with the audience. Do you think that it excludes the audience when a, when a singer-songwriter either has their eyes shut for the performance or doesn't address the audience? Or do you think, going back to your, your example of John Morland at End of the Road there, does it make you want to get closer to him as a performer if he doesn't address you? What's going on there in that kind of dynamic? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fascinating question. And, and I've seen it work in all ways. I've seen singer-songwriters who don't say anything and it comes across as exclusive and arrogant. And I've seen people talk and be really, really funny. And that sort of creates a barrier where the songs don't land as well. Um, I think John would be an example of a place where he didn't need to say anything. He's written it down in his song. Everything that he needed to tell us, he did. And for, for me, nothing was lost. And, and I, I got to the end of his performance and I did want him to tell us that he was okay um but we have to we have to trust that he is and he's about to release a new record which i can't wait to hear so um you know we we have that i i don't think it's a rule that if if a if a performer doesn't interact with their audience that it fails i think what what i feel like that means is that there's some kind of magical rule again where if you if you can get the alchemy of that correct you can not say a word and you can spend the whole time with your eyes closed and it can be beautiful um i i, I recall seeing uh, radiohead at the uh the uea in norwich and tom opened the set with an acapella song he came out with his finger in his ear and his eyes closed and he sang something from the bends without anyone else even on the stage without a note to sing to and and you're right what that does is everyone wants to get closer yeah they edge in and they hang on every word um i mean that was a long time ago and maybe a bad example because you know he, he went on to have the whole the whole band join him but yeah john didn't speak um and I'd love to know what the rules were. I, I, I kind of wish that it could be captured in a in a kind of guide. But I think it's like songwriting where there's too much which is kind of ethereal and it can't be captured in in an algorithm. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's all sorts of um, you know there are all sorts of performance theories on where a songwriter should look so for example mode of address you know if they're talking to if they're talking if they're singing about god and the world then their eyes should look up above the audience if they're addressing you as in a lost lover or whatever it be then they might look across at the audience and actually make sort of almost eye contact and then they might look down or close their eyes in the more introspective vulnerable parts of the song yeah, you know, yeah. they, 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 there are these guides out there from theatre performance and, and these, you know, performance studies. And I, I think that's quite interesting. I've never thought consciously about it. If I think about the last time that I, I did a gig, it was at the Glag Cafe and I opened with an a cappella song. And I'd had, no. I got a, um, uh, some foot percussion and I got the sound guy to just mic that up. And there was a lot of foot stomping and just my voice. It was very naked, um, quite raw. And, um, and it was a surprise more than anything. Yeah, and I imagine you really captured people's imaginations. I think so. The, <laughs> the, yeah. the problem was is that we had a very, very limited audience, but maybe that wasn't a problem. The woman I opened for, she'd come up from London, so didn't didn't necessarily know people in the area, so it was was kind of limited, but it was an int- really interesting kind of playground as well, and I just thought, this is what I'm going to do. But, uh, but I, I, 
I tend to sort of, I like to be in that place of not knowing necessarily what I'm going to do as well. So um, it's, yeah. it's almost yeah. like that that kind of um, when you're in that zone, but you've got freedom to kind of see what happens. I, I don't think it's, I'm glad you used the word theatre. I think that it is, and anyone who claims that they're performing live music and rejects the idea that it's theatre is wrong, in my humble opinion. Mm. Um, that might be your theatre. Maybe your theatre is that you don't give a shit. So cool, no worries, that's, that's your decision and you don't have to care. You can just nonchalantly play songs. And there are plenty of examples of where that's done brilliantly and it works really well. Um, I, 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 like to, I like to not think about it I feel that I would be hamstrung yeah. into inaction if I considered a rule. I know I've performed the whole song with my eyes closed before because it's needed that. Um, I know that I've seen um, I've seen performers perform a whole song staring into an individual in the audience's eyes in order to kind of create a sense of tension, and I've seen that work uh, beautifully. It, it's it's all theatre. Everything you do, everything you wear, and where you stand, and how you stand, and who and what you look at. It's it's all it all creates the uh, the atmosphere of the show, and and like I said, I think that extends to people who who say no, it doesn't. That's not true. Um, Th that's just your theatre. I mean, M Mac DiMarco is a great example of a, a brilliant. Um, he's he's great at the theatre of it, and all of that comes from he doesn't give a shit about the theatre of it. But that is the theatre of it. Mm. So mm. yeah, that, that's really interesting. Yeah, um, I've been reading this this book, Artist at Work: Proximity of Art and Capitalism by Bajana Kunz, 2015. It's it's a great read. I recommend it. She's she's kind of talking about the, the boundaries between art and life, and her argument huh. is is that we we need to, in order to have autonomy, we need to bring those boundaries back. We need to reinforce them. I'm quite interested in this because of the way that that I feel like through my life, my art and my life there's not you know my art is my life um there's not really been much of a kind of separation there at times so especially in terms of songwriting and um self portraiture travelogues documents that i've made um tied into my journeys being in transition the way that i'm kind of making work and sort of narrativizing things as i go as well mm. um so just reading reading an extract from it and she she brings up mark fisher and his his term capitalist realism that we're in a place where artists autonomy needs to reclaim those boundaries because they they don't exist so if we think about um instagram as an example this this free curation that we're all doing of our lives you know somebody's making a profit out of that that was the cleverest thing you know getting us to do it for free facebook this is free and it will always will be yeah right what, what, what's your thoughts on all this yeah god there's a lot there I mean, isn't I, there i feel pretty <laughs> out of my depth on this question i think um this, this sounds like a um it's just it's a fascinating concept do you think anything's for free Huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah but do I think anything is for free? I mean, I am trying to pay my bills by making art at the moment, and it's impossible. It's really, really, it's it, I can't. It can't be done. I don't think. Um, I, I give photographs to Instagram, and Instagram charges companies to advertise shoes to the people that look at my pictures. Um, I don't earn money from that. I, I point people at my website and that maybe if they like them, they'll pay for a photo shoot, but people don't really like to do that either. Um, it's, it's not particularly tangible. Um, I kind of feel like my whole life is for free at the moment. <laughs> <That's>, uh... <laughs> I, I'm just thinking, because I've put, you know, throughout the last kind of, um, say... I don't know, however long really, it doesn't matter in terms of time, but I've been putting stuff out and doing stuff and kind of engaging in this curation of my own life for the profit of companies. Yeah. But if if you don't have these accounts and you shut them down, you know, and I, I've come off Facebook and I'm not, I can't deal with it. I just can't deal with it. But um, mm. Instagram, Twitter, 
kind of they have so many advantages in ways. I'm, I, I found you via Twitter. I found my podcast interviewees on Twitter. Um, I, it's 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 such an immediate way to engage with people in the songwriting community. Without it, it would take me a lot longer in real terms to source this information online find these people um so the way that we find one person leads us to another that kind of you know go, go, going off building building your i don't like the word network um but finding people you know has, has become so easy yeah. through twitter it's um so if you if you're not on these platforms where do you go um gretchen peters put a put a tweet out the other week about facebook and and obviously she's she's really concerned and but she was saying if she comes off Facebook, she almost doesn't exist, you know, online because everybody's going there. But she's come to the point of asking people to subscribe to her um, to her website, through her website, to her email email list. So um, she wants to obviously go down that, that road so she can be less reliant on Facebook. I just think it's it's almost no win. It's it, What do you think? I mean, you know, Facebook specifically, the, the moment I left there was the, when uh, Zuckerberg gave his testament to the uh, uh, the Senate and states where he talked about, um, he, he refused to say that WhatsApp messages aren't scraped yeah. for advertising purposes. I mean, I don't think, um, I, I started to notice that if I said I have got a gig or I am available for a photo shoot on my Facebook time, Mind, that would be um, that would be put in 25% of my followers timelines because Facebook want me to pay to promote it and it all felt so insidious that I, I couldn't stand and just watch that happen so I left and I haven't been on Facebook for a couple of years and I feel like I've paid the price for that I feel like that's that costs me work every day yeah. um, I don't get as many people come to a show and I don't get to do as many videos and I feel like I really should go back there. I, I feel like what, what we're kind of given is a, is an environment to operate in and the world is the way it is. We, we have the government that we have. We are, we are going to get Brexit done. So we must exist in that framework. And that framework says that I need to share my picture on Instagram. And what will happen is that someone who followed me because they liked a gig or a record that I did will follow, will like it and that will flag it to someone else who might need a photo shoot. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll get work and then I'll be able to pay to own a mobile phone which will let me update pictures to my Instagram feed. It, 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 it feels kind of advanced and it feels kind of crappy um, but ultimately, I don't like to complain because I get to make things. You know, I, I have somewhere to live and uh, the ability to spend my time making music and pictures. And not everyone has that. So, yeah, I, I don't like lots about it, but I feel like I have to kind of float on top of it. It would be really easy to sink underneath it, but I choose not to do that. Yeah. That's kind of what my record is about, uh, you know, just surviving that kind of stuff i don't mean my record is about surviving my exit from facebook um, <laughs> <laughs> that might be a good but record it, <laughs> next time next, next time, time yeah <laughs> will you give me a credit <laughs> Yeah, that's right. But it's it's like you've got it. You've got it in order to resist nowadays. Resistance. No, you've got to be within the system to resist. If you resist and you come off Facebook, you see the loss. Yeah, yeah. Because you you can't. You know, you can't yeah. reach that particular um, audience. If particular being the wrong word, but um, where does resistance lie nowadays? Where can you resist? What are the sites of resistance? I mean, you, you know, that's what's interesting about that is that it's a couple of days after the election and my Twitter was full beforehand of people saying that Labour would win and afterwards full of people suggesting that uh, they were angry that they didn't and suggesting why. Um, and, you know, the, the phrase that it's just a sort of a leftist echo chamber bubble, I, I could open my phone now and see that regurgitated 20 times. I don't know why I'm not a political analyst. I'm not a social media analyst. I know what I think is right. I know that I try my best to. Uh, I was volunteering for a homeless charity for a while because I felt 
quite close to that. And I felt that, you know, uh, it, it was good to spend your time helping. I, I intend to take stuff to do, uh, the Trussell Trust to give out to food banks. But I'm not trying to be like a sycophantic charity user as a response to the election. I think there's just basic human decency. And I don't see how the Tories stand for that. But, but like more people in this country think that they stand for something they want than what I think. So I'm in a minority. And uh, uh, I don't know, I have to exist in that, in that, in that universe. Um, I, I've had it said before to me in arguments, well, if you don't like it, then you should leave the country. Um, but, you know, I'm still here. Uh, I don't see much to be nationally proud about, but um, I do like this country. And I have no intention of leaving it. Um, I intend to flow on top of it and exist inside it. And I'll, I'll use Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and everything else as I see fit. Mm. Um, and I mean, I, I kind of suggest that other people do the same. Um, you know, if, if you see something wrong, then, then you, you, should, you should try and change it. Or, or you should accept that that's the way that life is. And, you know, we've got um, Damien Lewis saying maybe we need to get insurance now in case we break our leg. Well, there you go. It's, it begins. Um, yeah. You can sink underneath that or you can exist alongside it. And I'll need to take more photographs or make more videos and sell more records if I want to pay for health insurance as if I lived in America. Um, so I chose to not vote for that. But also that one... So yeah, you just have to um, just have to find a way to make it work for you, and I think that's the same as uh, in life as it is in social media. Yeah, coming back coming back to the autonomy there. So I, I'm I'm kind of there's been a majority Tory landslide, and I put a tweet out um, the other day, <laughs> one of many um, my rants, but it, it it was about the fact that I don't know any. Tory voters, except for my mother, my brother, and extended family in the Labour heartlands, it's quite phenomenal, really. Somebody else put put out a really good tweet, which was that the the most radical thing could be that former Labour mining villagers have voted Tory. Yeah. What could be more radical than a former mining, you know, town voting Tory? It, now it's quite it's astounding what's belief, happened. Doesn't it? it really does, and and I, I don't. Think it feels genuinely intimidating and scary. I mean, it does. Um, Do you think people have just, a lot of people also are so used to the system, to the ruling class, to the, the that it's almost like, well, just let them get on with it? Yeah, that's right. Those people sound like they must know what they're they talking about. They sound like about. they know, they, they look like they know, yeah. School. I mean, my mother would say to me, Corbyn's not fit for office. Um, you know, he's not a statesman, he can't do what Boris can do, basically. Yeah, and we know Boris can charm... You know, he's charmed them all in Europe. He can speak the language. He's had that ed the, the, the privilege of, of being able to get to speak French fluently, which most of us haven't. Um, there was a poll that I saw after the prime uh, the the leaders debate on the on the television, where um, they asked three questions afterwards, which is which one of those leaders do you yeah, trust yeah. the most? Yeah. And seventy five percent of viewers said Corbyn, and they said which one would do a better job. Uh, for the country and 75% uh, of viewers I don't know the number don't quote me on the number but it was lots most people said well Corbyn would do the best job and um, you know he seems really trustworthy and the third question was which one's the most prime ministerial and the answer was overwhelmingly Boris <laughs> and that's, that's the trick <laughs> that's, that's the trick that the ruling class pull off they make my mum think that posh people seem like leaders Yeah, and they're not they don't represent me. They don't care about my interests as a, a relatively vulnerable person in society. And I mean, I'm not the most vulnerable by a long stretch. I'm a, I'm a healthy white male, but I am financially fairly vulnerable. They, they care to help me. My, uh, my, uh, my work comes because of me, but they won't be supporting that. They won't be making that easier. Brexit won't make it so I can go and play a show in Europe more easily. It will make it harder. Mm. Um, and I know all the reasons why uh, conservative voters will say, uh, you know, I just need to start whining and get over it. And I need to work within the system. And I shall. I shall work within the system. But, um, yeah, I'm angry and scared. Yeah, and people fear Corbyn more than they fear Boris. Is is the point? You know, they fear Corbyn being in office more than they fear 
Sophia Boris um, with this huge majority. That's what I find interesting. There was another poll as well about trust and um, it had Boris Johnson on, think, under 30% trust. This poll was a few days before the election. No. It's astounding, really. And that's, really, again, you know? the trick. Yeah. They've all pulled where the ruling class, the privileged school goers, convince us that trust isn't the thing that's needed to be a leader, yeah. to be a policymaker. The, the thing that they need is they need, like, some kind of education that they can only get. The decency doesn't come into it. Um, a Tory voter doesn't care that Mark Spencer, my local MP, said that this disabled guy who had no legs just needed to get better at timekeeping. He, he, he doesn't care. He doesn't need to care. But, like, it's not perceived that that is a quality that he needs to have. What he needs to have is experience of being a in the ruling class because he'll learn about that then, and we're all serfs. So we'll be back in a world. Okay, that's where they'll put us. You know, it's it's heartbreaking though. I walking around places like Dewsbury Town Centre, pound shops, boarded up charity shops, um, decimated Wakefield, uh, Mansfield, where I was born. These places, Mansfield went over to Tory. Um, it had been under Alan Neal for many many years, and in the last election, Tory won it. So that was a landmark for them. It's been held um, by the current Tory candidate now, and then somewhere like Dewsbury's become Tory. So do the people living in Dewsbury think, do they really think Boris Johnson is going to do anything to make life a bit more feasible in Dewsbury town centre? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. No, I mean, uh, Those you know, that have voted, I it's going to affect them the most. Yeah. At the uh, Mansfield Civic Centre next week. Have you? Talk <laughs> about my unit uh, oh. So, you know, I go there every week. Do and, you? And no, those people, they, they don't trust Boris Johnson, but he has convinced them that he's a posh guy and posh guys are meant to be in charge. Um, well, fuck posh guys because they're not in charge of me. No. <laughs> Alec, um, without second chances, we'd all be alone. Gregory Allen Isakov. Uh, Isakov, yeah. <laughs> What's this got to do with songwriting? What's this got to do with... What a beautiful, like, uh, what a beautiful line. Without second chances, we'd all be alone. And I don't think that it offers any... Maybe we will is kind of it. It doesn't say you have to give people a second chance. It doesn't say you shouldn't be alone. It just suggests that maybe it's okay. Maybe you can forgive that. Or maybe you shouldn't, and that you should stick by yourself. For, for, for me, that line has been a, a real... That, that song was on my um, list of production references for my record. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of think he, he does everything in that line that I tried to do on my whole album. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a big fan. And, uh, yeah, but you're, what's it got to do with actual writing? I don't know. I think, I think there's something about distilling all of the meaning that that line has. How many words is it? One, two, ah. three, four, seven. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking... Hey, you know. is this your bio? <laughs> yeah, I might change it to that. Yeah. <laughs> you can update your Twitter later, all right, and credit again. <laughs> Without second chances, we'd all be alone. I think why, again, I work quite intuitively with what I pick up when I um, tend to start, when I start researching my um, participants for the podcast, there are things that, you know, take a bit of time to get to know a person and their work. And then, then I sort of just go quite intuitively and pick out lines and things. So there are some, some references to myself here as well. But this is interesting as a line, isn't it? Because like you say, it's non-judgmental. It's, there's no imperative. It's not give, it's not we need to give second chances. Um, yeah. He's not telling us to do anything. There's something resol resolute about it. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good word. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm. It's it's like a it's like a battle cry, but it's a kind of more. It's not really a battle, and it's not really a cry. It's a kind of yeah. Uh, now I feel like I want to say it's a whimper, but it's not. It's a powerful. <laughs> when he says it's a quote quietly, and that just amplifies it for me. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's really it's really forgiving and affirmatory as well. It's, Alec, it's been wonderful to speak to you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having yeah. me on. I think um, that your uh, these questions have been amazing. So <laughs> I hope so. I do try. I wish you much <laughs> luck with the with um, the ongoing ongoing um, album work and tour. Are you? What's next for you? 
Uh, yeah, it's going to take a couple of months to get the album out, so yeah. that is going to be the focus. I've got um, it's being mixed at the moment, and then it'll need to be mastered. Um, and then, like I said, uh, uh, there'll be a CD version. I'm going to press one of those. Um, I've been saving up to do that, so uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be kind of pushing to sell some copies of that, and uh, hopefully playing some live shows to support it. So I was just thinking, there's. Uh... A, a, a girl um, that I came across, she, she's a singer-songwriter, and she'd made these beautiful handmade um, CD sleeves. And I just thought that's a really nice concept, just anti-plastic, so they're really kind of ecological and stuff. And um, I asked her how she did it, and she said, with a lot of blood and sweat. <laughs> and she just did it herself. Perfect. Yeah, no, that's great. It's been great to speak to you. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch. Thanks, thanks again for joining us, Alec. All the best. Thanks, Sam. You too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.